Welcome. So I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you for the organizers for the opportunity to present. I'm presenting on behalf of uh, myself, Amit Kera, Eric Minikel, uh, Sekar, and uh, Kath Kathar and David Van Heel. Um, I actually only have a 10 minute slot here, so I'm gonna skim through the details of the science fairly rapidly, um, but all the proposals were made available to everyone in the consortium, so please feel free to dive into the proposal for, uh, uh, for more of those details. So the goal in this uh, proposal is to start to flesh out uh, this catalogue of loss of function phenotypes for all human genes, beginning work that has obviously been going on for many decades in the context of Mendelian disease studies, but taking an approach here where we can leverage the enormous amounts of genetic and phenotypic data that have been collected by the, uh, the many cohorts that are present here in attendance today. And I want to start by, uh, uh, by going back to a, a figure from a review paper published in 2013 by Robert Plenge, Ed Skolnick, and David Altshuler, laying out the, one of the key advantages of human genetics in thinking about uh, drug target validation, as we just heard about in the previous slide. And that is the idea that human genetics provides a natural dose response curve that we can use to explore the relationship between the levels of a particular potential target or gene product and that disease phenotype. So for, for some genes that will be flat, indicating that that gene is not associated with phenotype. In other cases, we can use both loss of function and gain of function variants to explore the precise relationship between the dose of that gene across all of the tissues of an organism, uh, of a human, uh, across that entire lifespan, and that association with, with human disease. And that provides uh, compelling in vivo data in support of, of various therapeutic hypotheses. And in exploring these hypotheses, a particularly useful class of variants has been loss of function alleles, variants that are predicted to cause complete disruption of protein coding genes. Uh, and this table shows a list of a number of the cases where we have genes where loss of function variants, often uh, very low frequency loss of function variants, are associated with protection against disease. Uh, many of these, for various reasons, falling in cardiovascular disease, at least one example now in type 2 diabetes. And these variants are useful because they provide in vivo models of lifetime systemic inhibition of that particular gene. So that allows us to assess both whether that uh, inhibiting that particular gene, so therapeutic inhibition of that gene, would be an effective way of treating that disease, but also give us some insight into potential uh, safety indicators as well. That is whether inhibition would be well tolerated uh, by humans. And the, uh, the power of the human genetics approach, of course, in this is that we have uh, enormous amounts of variation that exists in the, naturally, in the natural human population that we can take advantage of. So one can do a, a reasonably robust back of the envelope calculation that tells us that given known mutation rates across the genome and the way that they vary, uh, it is likely that any given mutation, any given single base change that is compatible with life almost certainly exists somewhere in the human population, um, probably typically in, in dozens or sometimes hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of individuals. So that provides us with effectively a saturation mutagenesis experiment that we can use to explore the relationship between the impact of variation, including loss of function variation and, and human phenotypes. But of course, that doesn't guarantee that those changes will be found in a homozygous or compound heterozygous state that results in complete gene, acti gene inactivation that is a human knockout. And in order to find human knockouts, we typically need to look beyond uh, large-scale outbred European populations and focus on populations that have different properties that increases the probability of a, of a rare homozygous variant being present. And the two strategies that we can take in, in uh, looking at these are firstly to look at bottleneck populations, and Mark Daly gave a fantastic <coughs> example earlier of the Finnish population, which serves to enrich for a set of variants that have managed to pass through a population bottleneck and then become common in the population. These can include relatively deleterious variants that then bump up to relatively high frequency within that population. And that in the case of loss of function variants, that can mean that a relatively small number of genes have more common loss of function variants that can be explored. So uh, the advantage of the bottlenecked population is that there will, tip, there will often be many samples per gene that you can use to do robust statistical calculations of the link between loss of function variants and human phenotypes. And an alternative strategy that can be pursued is to look at consanguineous populations, and this hasn't really come up much so far in this, in this uh, conference. Consanguineous populations, that is populations where there is a high level of parental relatedness, um, are, are uh, important for knockout discovery because they increase the probability that a rare variant that happens to be heterozygous in both of the parents, identical by descent, is homozygous in the child. So that increases very substantially the probability that human, uh, that rare loss of function variants will be found in a homozygous state in those individuals. And in a number of publications that I'll talk about later, uh, we've shown that this is an extremely efficient way of enriching for, uh, for rare homozygous knockouts. <coughs> so we think that the optimal strategy for identifying human knockouts in the human population will be firstly to integrate data across multiple populations because each population represents a single draw of rare variation and therefore each population will often give us a subset of genes that we can explore in more detail. 
Uh, secondly, to focus on populations with specific characteristics, ideally those with high levels of historical bottlenecks or with consanguinity. And then finally, of course, to focus on sequenced cohorts where the genetic data are available, uh, but that all, where we also have the capacity to move into deep phenotype data and, and wherever possible to perform genotype-based recontact to allow deep uh, genotype-guided phenotyping uh, to explore the impact of inactivation of a specific gene. So uh, the team that we've assembled for, for this proposal has a lot of experience in a number of areas. Uh, we've spent a lot of time working on aggregating genomic data. Uh, we've led the Exome Aggregation Consortium and the Genome Aggregation Database, currently the largest public databases of sequenced individuals, so we know how to pull together large amounts of sequencing data and make that harmonized and, and work together. Uh, our, our group has developed tools both for automated and also for manual curation, specifically of loss of function variants, including the tool Lofty, which is now very widely used to clean up annotation artifacts identified in sequencing data from loss of function variants. And we've also led many of the major academic uh, loss of function genetic studies uh, over the last decade, uh, many, some of which I've listed here. And then importantly, we've actually spent, as a, as a team, spent a lot of time looking at how we can identify these human knockouts particularly looking in, uh, in individuals from consanguineous populations, and then, and then through that go through to explore the, uh, the underlying phenotypes of, of rare individuals where a specific gene has been knocked out either in a homozygous or heterozygous state, and therefore learn more about the potential role of, the, of those genes as uh, therapeutic targets. So our goals in response to this proposal, uh, firstly to produce a catalogue of loss of function variants from sequencing data, uh, existing sequencing data across a number of uh, IHCC cohorts and beyond. Secondly, to continue to uh, develop the ethical, finance, financial, uh, logistical and technical framework that's required for the very challenging process of uh, large-scale global recontact experiments. And those of you who have done these experiments will know this is a deeply non-trivial exercise. Uh, thirdly, to recontact sequenced individual world, uh, individuals worldwide across multiple cohorts who are heterozygous or homozygous for loss of function variants, consent and phenotype those individuals in an ethically responsible way, and then finally develop and release a public database of loss of function variants that allows the world to take advantage of the data that is generated as part of this project. So again, uh, the, the proposal has the, the big details. I don't have time to go through them in, in huge detail here, but a, a few things of note. Uh, the, first, the first point is that we plan to focus on a number of uh, cohorts where we know that there are in, uh, an enrichment for loss of function, for homozygous loss of function individuals. These would include two uh, cohorts with high levels of consanguinity, the East London Genes and Health Cohort, led by David Van Heel, the Promise Cohort as well, uh, which is based in Pakistan, one bottlenecked population, the FinGen Cohort, which we've already heard about today. Um, all three of these cohorts have the, have the additional advantage of having considerable existing sequencing data that can be used for harmonization, but we would also welcome, of course, participation from other IHCC cohorts where there, re where there are likely to be uh, human knockouts present and where sequencing data has already been generated. The second step is to harmonize the raw sequencing data through the NOMAD uh, ag data aggregation pipeline and to then identify and manually curate loss of function variants across the entire set. Um, and then once we've identified loss of function variants in genes of particular interest, and here a plan would be to focus at least initially on uh, known existing drug targets as well as other genes of, of high value for potential validation, uh, we, would, we would collect and harmonize existing phenotype data from over a thousand individuals per year. These would be human knockouts, some loss of function carriers, and matched control individuals from those cohorts. And then finally, do recontact uh, and, and perform deeper targeted phenotyping in a gene specific fashion for roughly 50 individuals per year. Uh, these individuals would have loss of function variants in about five genes per year of high uh, particular interest. And the, the idea for targeted phenotyping here would be things like a standardized questionnaire uh, crossing multiple phenotype questions, lab tests, and potentially metabolomics, and also wherever possible to obtain cells where the cells would then allow us to directly experimentally validate that the variant in question is actually loss of function. And then uh, we think for a, for a proposal like this, and of course for this consortium, it's critical that the results that we produce are disseminated more widely than simply through publication. Um, and we would hear, uh, we would, we, our proposal here is to build on the experience we have with a very heavily used uh, Nomad browser to create a portal, the human knockout portal, that would display all known human loss of function variants, both from our collected cohort data as well as from other large aggregated sequence data sets like NOMAD. This would contain a list of curated and annotated loss of function variants with deep amounts of information about the, uh, the degree of uh, the, the, how certain we are that those variants are actually real and how confident we are in the underlying annotations. It, it would also contain wherever possible aggregated phenotype data collected from the experiments that I've described earlier. And then wherever, where cohorts were interested in potentially being recontactable by the broader public for follow-up experiments, it would also be possible in this uh, portal to provide 
the relevant contact details for each cohort so that once you found an individual who has a loss of function variant of interest, you could then uh, know which, con which cohort to contact to perform those downstream recall by genotype studies. Uh, in terms of the overall budget, we envisage an initial phase of three years, and the uh, budget in this initial phase would involve uh, $1.8 million in central funding to handle the data management and analysis, including the non-trivial job of joint calling and harmonizing that sequence data, the software development for the portal itself, as well as the coordination activities across the recall studies, and then per cohort funding uh, to support the, recon the, deep, uh, the, uh, the cost associated with recontact of each individual. And then obviously we're then a proposal to potentially continue into a second phase if this first phase is successful, which would include funding of sequencing of selected cohorts. Uh, new data is clearly required to expand the amount of data that's available for recontacting these, uh, these human knockouts, and then continued funding for analysis, recall experiments, and the, and the development of the portal. Uh, thanks very much for that. We look forward to further discussion of this proposal with the rest of the consortium. Maybe one question that works. Yeah. Dan, um, Rory Collins, Oxford. Uh, I mean, this may be a question to, to others as well, but um, why would you do this in prospective cohorts um, uh, rather than in um, well-characterized uh, individuals with a particular disease? Um, what's the advantage other than opportunism um, of going for prospective cohorts? Well, I think there's the, the one key advantage, of course, is that you would identify phenotypes that you're not ascertaining for in the initial, in the initial approach. So you could, you could uh, in, a, in a phenotype guided approach where you're enri enriching for phenotypes to start with, which I think is what you're proposing, to start with a targeted piece where you go after individuals of specific phenotypes to begin with and then look for, for enrichment of LOFs in that case. Well, what I was getting at is if you're interested in identifying yeah. something related to coronary disease, for example, um, starting with people who have coronary disease or people with particular types of stroke that have been very well characterized rather than poorly, relatively poorly characterized individuals in prospective cohort in terms of their disease. Yes. Um, would seem to be a more efficient strategy. I, th I think both are useful in the sense. And, why, and obviously why, why do it in prospective cohorts rather than, as I say, opportunism? So, th so the case control design, I think, is, is clearly very powerful if you know the exact phenotype that you're going after. And, and of course, many people here in this room and elsewhere are already doing large, well-powered case control studies of, of those types of phenotypes. I think the advantage in this case is the being able to go after phenotypes that you don't necessarily know about in advance. So situations where it's not clear exactly what the outcome will be for that particular gene. Or were you going in with a particular phenotype where you have a, a, a specific gene that you're interested in targeting for a reason, but don't yet know the phenotype associated with that gene? <laughs> then again, going after and only only by identifying in a sequence-based way those rare loss of function carriers, will you actually be able to deeply understand exactly what happens if that gene is knocked out? You won't necessarily get at that through phenotype-guided experiments. And certainly for safety studies, that will be a key thing as well. Again, if we're not if we're not ascertaining on the basis of a specific safety phenotype, we won't necessarily know that the human knockout has that particular safety profile. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. Precisely, that's right. Yeah. 